everybody. Thanks a lot for the invitation of being able to talk in such an interest panel and so on. I want to ask you something before starting. What is the first thing that you think about Peru, if you hear the name nowadays? Inca. You look here Incas, yes. What else? Maya. Maya. Although it's not from the region. <laughs> what else do you think about it? Not from the region. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It's Mexican. <laughs> Cusco, yes. Brilliant answer. Archaeosite, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but also food. Ceviche. Yep, ceviche and all of this. <laughs> okay, I will try to share with you a little bit of what we as paleontologists in Peru, because I'm not talking today as a PhD student here in Switzerland, I'm talking here as a Peruvian at the moment. I will share you a little bit of what we are doing in Peru with these guys that you see on the screen. I work on fossil marine mammals, which are dolphins, whales, and on the left side you have an extract of some of the materials we have been working on across South America. Before starting, how many of you know what is parachute science? Parachute, parachute science, parachute science. <laughs> All right, this is the modern way of colonialism. This happens nowadays and it's when scholars from the global north go to the south and do research in the south and publish and they get acknowledgement by it, but they do not are uh, reciprocs with the people that are local. And this has been documented a lot of times. Now, what I want to show you on the screen and what you have on the right side are some graphics when we quantified how is this impact of parachute science happening in South America across several different countries. Colombia, Peru, Chile, Argentina. And if you see on the graphics, there are several of them. The first one, letter A, mentions how many of the papers of the research are led either by Latin Americans, local scientists, and compared to people from the global north. If you see the trend there, there is a lot of presence from uh, scholars from the global north working in Latin America. The second one is because we were also interested in the gender bias, how many of them are females? Third one, talking about natural history collections. How many of the materials that we are studying from the global south, from in this case Latin America, are stored in collections within Latin America? If you see, it's about 75-78% that are only on local connections, and then we have around 20% that is still on a completely different place of the world. Now, um, let's go to the graphic that is in the town part of it, right? You see that there is a starting to happen a trend. Local scientists are growing, are growing, and are starting to publish more. They are getting more into these topics. They are getting more interest. But it's different. Let's talk about why. Why do you think that it's different a museum of natural history in South America to a museum of natural history here in Europe? Compare the Museum of Berlin, because we have been talking about Berlin, compare the Museum of Paris, compare this Smithsonian Museum to a local museum in South America. If you go to the Natural History Museum of Lima, it's not going to be bigger than this entire Natural History Museum of Neuchatel. If you look at our fossil collection, it's not going to be bigger than this room. So how can we compare one place and the other place? This gives me, and this brings me to the second part of this presentation. What is the proper message that we as local scientists want to give the world? Which is the proper message for us? Well, you need to acknowledge something. The accessibility to funds that we have in the South is not the same. We are not capable of going for expeditions, the biggest expeditions, for example. You remember, there was some time in the 1920s where Robert Champ and Andrews went to Mongolia and started digging tons of fossils. We don't have that time of uh, budget, and those are not our priorities. It's really different. So, this gives me to the second point. We have places with fossils. You see on the right side of the slide, um, fossil that we have on Peru, in the Ukukaje Basin. And um, what can we do with the fossils? Fossils are no longer being carried out to other countries, and our fossils that are still on the field are the priority. We are not able to get fossils that were exported illegally, yet not so clearly ethically uh, situations. So 
what is the priority of the local museum? Is it like hosting all the fossils that might be brought back? Or is it like trying to do more research with the funds, the material, and what you have available at the moment? And also really important, what is wiser financially? An expedition costs 4,000, 5,000 US dollars to get one of the fossils back just to the Natural History Museum of Lima. The repatriation process is super long. There are no laws in every single country and not all the same museums have the same way of thinking. So let's go to the next slide. Also important is who delivers the message. And this is really important for me because I will show you a little bit of what is my current work in Peru. Um, and if we, I would have to say it in some way in <laughs> Spanish would be hacerlo la peruana, which means you need to be creative with whatever resources you have available at the moment. And we have plenty of problems. Um, let's start with this example, which is something that I have been working since 2015 when I was a bachelor student. There are many fossils that I went from Peru to other countries. You see fossils from Peru in Paris, in London, in Berlin, here in Switzerland, in Japan. Many of them have been exported. And curators in several of these museums have a specific, a really important material that is called a holotype. You know what a holotype is, right? Holotype is the specimen which should be based the description of a new species and it's the one that is the basis of it. And I'm going to show you one of these holotypes described in 1988 by Christian de Muisson named Scaphocoja cochlearis. This fossil is in the Natural History Museum of Paris. All right? We got a foreigner who went to South America, who carried out the fossil, they had the fossil in Paris, and they described it. Cool. Or not cool? What do you think? Cool or not? You have a fossil already in Paris. You are building a natural history collection. That is great. But uh, should we bring it back? This is a moment where who delivers the message is important. Because it's not the same that if somebody from Paris, from Berlin, from London comes to Peru and works on fossils that are there, that if a local scientist who is working there changes this system that was brought so many years and starts to talk about it. And that's why we went collecting for new fossils. And in 2020, we published a paper where the whole type was torn to the side. We uh, virtually made it non-viable any longer. We made it useless virtually because the whole type is important, but we had so many more specimens of the animal in this collection in Peru that nobody would care about the whole type, but they would care about our referred specimens, interspecific, interspecific variation. This is the message that we want to deliver. We have the power as local people to like produce the same type of quality science. And even more importantly, because in South America, depending on the country, we are really nationalistic, we can talk in different ways. I try to tackle this type of nationalism when we describe the new species. It's not the same as if a local scientist comes and tells you, I am describing this species and naming the eponymous using local language. Because it's a way of reevaluating the local language. And it's a way of saying, hey, this is part of our heritage. We're trying to improve this in the best way. The second specimen that we named was Skeifokoja totahpe. Totahpe is a mean in a language, dead language in Peru, that is Muchik. Muchik is a language that was spoken in the coast of Peru till 800, 900 years ago, and Tot and Achpe means big face, the bulky face, Skeifokoja. That is a good example of how you can tackle with um, the local societies. And now it's really interesting because Christian de Muisson, who is a really renewed paleontologist, is now working with us. He acknowledged that materials that are outside are outside. But now we can work all together to produce better science. And this is going on with colleagues from Brussels, Pisa, Berlin, Stuttgart, here in Switzerland. And we're trying to build up this network of having a local collection, but also all the connections that we had because of some stuff were legally exported, yes, not in the most ethical ways, but we are trying to build up this network to just produce more, more, and more. 
And having said that, our next objective is one of the jewels in the Natural History Museum of Paris, Synthesitis Peruvianus. That is the holotype, the one that you have on the right. And now we are showing off that we can do the same type of work because we have our new specimens that we are going to start working on. So this is just this small tiny piece of what we're trying to produce at the moment. I just wanted to share you that this is another way of decolonization that is from local initiatives. That's it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>